I started the VCAT Cinema Series in 2017, the first film I presented was Disney's Beauty and the Beast for subjective and objective reasons. Subjectively because it's my favorite film. Objectively because one week later, Disney's live action remake of Beauty and the Beast was set to hit theaters. Now I'm presenting Aladdin and its live action remake is in theaters this weekend. Does this mean I will always present a Disney animated classic here if it gets a remake? Well, the Lion King remake is out in two months and I'd hate to fall short of expectations. Plus, I'll take any excuse to watch a Disney movie. Anyway, Aladdin, Walt Disney Pictures 32nd animated film was released on November 25th, 1992. It was directed by Ron Clements and John Musker, the same partnership that brought The Little Mermaid to life three years prior, and then would go on to direct many other Disney films like Hercules, Princess and the Frog, and more recently, Moana. Musker and Clements also wrote the screenplay with Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, the writing team that also wrote the first Shrek, and all five Pirates of the Caribbean films. Um, the film stars Scott Weinger, Linda Larkin, Jonathan Freeman, Gilbert Gottfried, and of course, Robin Williams as the genie. Aladdin is a musical, as you probably already know, with music and lyrics created by regular Disney collaborators Alan Menken and the late Howard Ashman. The idea of an Aladdin film actually came from Howard Ashman after the good work he, Menken, Musker, and Clemmix did with Mermaid. And because of all the good work they did with Mermaid, which put Disney back on top, they were obviously going to let these guys do whatever they want. The story of Aladdin is based on one of the most popular folk tales from the collection 1001 Nights, or Arabian Nights, as it is known in English-speaking territories, which was published in the 18th century in the Middle East. As much as a fun, uplifting, and high-energy film Aladdin is, there was a lot of frustration, difficulty, and even heartbreak to make it the successful film we know it is today. As I said, the original concept for an Aladdin film came from lyricist Howard Ashman, who pitched the idea to Musker and Clements. They chose to make Aladdin over Beauty and the Beast, which in hindsight was probably a tough choice to make. Ashman originally wrote a 40-page treatment of the film, which they used for their original pitch. How animated films normally made is you sketch the whole film out in storyboards, you film those with dummy voice recordings, you pitch that to the higher-ups, and then, once you get the green light, you do your official voice casting, and then you animate. When the filmmakers pitched their original idea for Aladdin, the Disney Studio CEO and Hollywood's favorite sourpuss, Jeffrey Katzenberg, went, it's a lot of movie, guys. A few minutes later, word got back to the crew that, yeah, he hated it. He wants you to start from scratch which is exactly what you want to hear when your hand-drawn animated film is due out in a year. They were in a pretty tough spot. Beauty and the Beast was just winding down, and if they couldn't turn this around quick, there would soon be a lot of animators over at Disney with no work to do. They restructured the entire story in just eight days, and after that is when the screenwriters, Elliot and Rossio, were brought in and interviewed, and the story you see today started to come to life. While this may seem like a typical Hollywood speed bump, it was met with a lot of sadness among the filmmakers. At this time, Howard Ashman had passed away due to complications from AIDS. So they were essentially throwing out a majority of his original vision of the film without his input, which is very hard to do. He would never get to see the final product of Aladdin or Beauty and the Beast for that matter, but he was much more personally connected to the former. Perhaps the biggest thing that was cut from the film was the role of Aladdin's mother, who was a major player in the film, and a song called Proud of Your Boy. The song meant a lot to Howard Ashman because he drew inspiration from his own relationship with his mother, and the filmmakers knew that, and even after they cut the character of the mother, they strived to find a way to keep the song in the film, but it just wasn't working. There is a bit of a silver lining, though. The song did find new life as a bonus feature on the first Aladdin DVD. Clay Aiken did a cover, and the song was reworked into the Broadway show, so Howard still got to share the song with the world. Among other things that were cut out or altered from his original treatment, the genie was much less of a showman and more of a hipster jazz musician. Aladdin had three best friends who were also saved by the Broadway musical. Aladdin was much younger, and instead of having only three wishes, the genie granted unlimited wishes, which sort of takes the urgency out of the story, so that was probably a good change. The filmmakers originally had a tough time breaking the character of Aladdin. Story-wise, the question was, how do you make a thief likable? Because you don't want young kids to start thinking stealing is cool. The scene after where he steals the bread and gives it to the kids, that turns Aladdin into a Robin Hood type, a thief with a heart of gold, a diamond in the rough, if you will. And they also didn't want to make him too much of a goody two-shoes because then he becomes boring. And animation-wise, they were trying not to make Aladdin look like the boring Prince Charming character. 
So originally they drew him much younger, much scrawnier, like he had something to prove to the world. The problem was they, the way they were designing Jasmine, it looked like there was no way she would get with this guy. <laughs> they were modeling her after Jennifer Connelly and they were modeling him after Michael J. Fox, with no offense to Mr. Michael J. Fox. So instead, they remodeled Aladdin after Tom Cruise, which is still not a super ethnically accurate choice for a Middle Eastern fairy tale, but it's the 90s, what are you going to do? The thing is, though, if you look real close in the film, you can see spots where Aladdin still looks, in his still looks kind of like his younger design. But they decided while Aladdin would look like a heroic leading man, his insecurities would come from within, and his story would be about him recognizing his own self-worth and what he has to offer as himself. He presents himself as confident, but inside he's really not. And the film is about him realizing that he is that dude. Scott Weinger voices Aladdin. Outside of this film, you probably recognize him best as DJ's boyfriend Steve on Full House. I don't know, I never watched Full House. Linda Larkin voices Princess Jasmine. Neither Weinger nor Larkin provided the singing voices for their characters. Those duties fell to Brad Kane and Leah Salonga, who also provided the singing voice of Mulan. Bit of fun fact, you might want to hold on to that one. Scott Weinger actually taped his audition alongside his mom, who played the genie to his Aladdin. And the filmmakers loved her so much, they basically said, if this thing with Robin Williams doesn't work out, we're just going to cast your mom. Stand-up comedian Gilbert Gottfried plays the parrot Iago, his second most famous role as a bird. And Jonathan Freeman plays Jafar. In earlier versions of the script, Jafar was actually the ill-tempered loudmouth, and Iago was the calmer and poised one. But when they cast Godfrey, they switch personalities. And little fun fact, Jonathan Freeman is still playing Jafar to this day in the Broadway show of Aladdin. And yes, of course, Robin Williams played the genie. They had him in mind for the role when they were writing the script, but they had no idea if they could get him because he was a major movie star. When he came in to hear their pitch, animator Eric Goldberg actually animated the character to some bites from some of Robin Williams' stand-up albums. Robin loved it and signed on shortly after. Robin Williams recorded over 16 hours of dialogue, and that is a lot more than what you hear in the film. When he signed on is when all the pop culture references and celebrity impressions came out. Those weren't in the script. They had just given, them, given him like little prompts like for each scene, like, hey, talk like a game show host. And that's another thing. Pop culture references and contemporary humor weren't really in Disney films because they felt they sort of dated them. So Aladdin broke the rules a bit, but it works fine because even if you don't know who the heck he's impersonating, it just comes off as, oh, he's just doing a funny character. And can you imagine the hands of this poor animators trying to keep up with his energy? My god. One thing you probably don't recognize right off the bat is Robin Williams is also the voice of the peddler who opens the film and addresses the audience. Originally, this character was supposed to appear throughout the film as a narrator singing different reprisals of Arabian Night. And then it would be revealed at the end that the genie was the peddler, but that was cut for one reason or another. But that scene still helps to set the comedic tone of the film that comes later, because sort of without it, the genie's appearance sort of takes the film down a sharp left turn. It sadly wasn't all laughs for Robin Williams and Disney, though. He took the role at a union scale of $75,000. His price tag at the time was about $8 million. On the condition that his name or image wouldn't be used in the marketing and that the character wouldn't be used in more than 25% of the advertising. Partially because he had another film called Toys coming out at the time and he really wasn't doing it for the money, he just did it because he wanted to be part of the Disney legacy and make something his kids could watch. Look at, wait for it, wait for it. Look at that poster and tell me if the genie takes up more than 25% of it. Yeah, Disney didn't exactly grant his wishes. But to be fair, to be fair, he told Disney to not use an animated character to sell toys or merchandise. Que sera. Obviously, Robin was very hurt and betrayed, and he refused to work with Disney ever again or ever reprise the role of the genie. It wasn't until years later when Jeffrey Katzenberg was fired and his replacement, Jim Roth, issued a public apology that Williams made amends with the studio and he would return to voice the genie for the 1996 direct-to-video sequel, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. For better or worse, Robin Williams as the genie changed the landscape of animated films, specifically how they are cast and how they are marketed. 
Before he came along, very rarely would a big name celebrity ever think of wasting their time on an animated film. Then Williams showed what a success it could be and Hollywood followed suit and more famous actors would do a voice role in an animated film. He got the ball rolling and probably not until Shrek came along did celebrity voice actors become much more of a marketing tool, much more in your face than it was back in 1992. But if you think about it, Robin Williams, if he, didn't, was, if he wasn't the genie, we probably wouldn't have Eddie Murphy as Donkey or Tom Hanks as Woody or Ellen DeGeneres as Dory. Many have tried to replicate the genie casting formula by just throwing any A-lister's voice behind the character. But what they failed to realize was this wasn't a publicity stunt. This role was written for him, and it was his heart and soul. It's arguably Williams' best role, and ever since his untimely passing in 2014, the genie has become a, a memorial to him. That one celebrity death that always gets me. <sighs> Musker and Clements wanted a way to find this film in a new, wanted to make this film in a new way. They felt that this has sort of been done in live action. How can we do it in animation differently? And that's not a lie. They actually said that in an interview. And it just sort of makes you wonder, were they ever even consulted when Disney decided to make a remake? Well, they found a way, though, through the character of the genie and his flashy magic and constant costume and impression changes. The style of the characters in the film reflects the work of famous character artist Al Hirschfield. After Beauty and the Beast with realistic looking character designs, they went for more basic shapes. When you strip away all the ink and paint, all the characters, I lost my pace, all the characters, all the characters are just basically one shape. Um, a lot of design of the film is based off Arabian style with rounded edges and exaggerated S curves, sort of inspired by actual Arabic calligraphy, with one exception, Jafar, our villain, is much more jagged and sharp edged in his design to convey that he doesn't belong. Jafar's design was actually modeled after Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty. The color of blue is used to represent goodness in the film, while red represents evil. And the color of gold is sort of a neutral, morally gray area, color pun not intended. This is back when the studio was still experimenting with CGI, and you'll see it in the film, particularly with the scenes in and out of the Cave of Wonders. Um, this is interesting. The magic carpet. The magic carpet is hand-drawn, but the pattern on him is CGI that was put on in post, which is pretty cool. A couple little fun tidbits. Whenever Aladdin lies, the feather on his turban flops down. He often throws an apple to Jasmine, which in ancient Greece was considered a marriage proposal. Foreshadowing. Mm -hmm. Also, Aladdin rolls an apple off his shoulder and down his arm to her at one point, which the filmmakers and I believe to be physically impossible. In test screenings, no one would applaud after the big musical numbers, so the animators added the applause sign onto Genie after the end of Friend Like Me, and that did the trick. And pay close attention because you may just spot cameos from Pinocchio, Sebastian from Beauty and the Beast, Sebastian from The Little Mermaid, and Beast from Beauty and the Beast. Aladdin defied expectations for the studio and became a major critical and commercial success. They didn't think they'd have another huge hit right after Beauty and the Beast. It became the highest grossing film of 1992, the 14th film and the first animated to gross over $200 million. It won the Academy Award for Best Song and Best Score and was nominated for a total of five. The Academy ruled it could not be nominated for Best Screenplay because Williams Improv made up half of the finished film, those poor writers. It won two Golden Globes and Williams himself won a Special Achievement Award for his work in the film. Disney would ride the coattails of Aladdin's success for many years. In 1994, the direct-to-video sequel, The Return of Jafar, was released on home video, starting the trend of Disney direct-to-video sequels. Yay! There was a TV series. Dan Castellana, the voice of Homer Simpson, would take over for the voice of Genie. And then, obviously, there was the third film, Aladdin and the King of Thieves, where Williams finally came back. There have been video games, comic books, a Broadway show, which is still running to this day. I saw it twice. It's really good. Um, it's had a lasting presence on Disney on Ice and Disney Parks, including but not limited to stage shows, parades, character meet and greets, and obviously the live action remake starring Will Smith, which is in theaters now. And then some people just dress up like him in their free time. Uh, Aladdin is the definition of a Disney classic in the same way as Beauty and the Beast of the Lion King. It has stood the test of time and has been adored by adults and children everywhere. Much like the story of its titular character, its, produ its production is a rag-to-riches story 
overcoming adversity, controversy, and loss. While much of the success of the film can be to contribute to the voice work of Robin Williams, I don't think we should overlook the core message of the film, which is recognizing your own self-worth. Um, that is a message that still resonates today, as much as when Howard Ashman wrote the first outline of the story in the early 90s. The work of Williams, Ashman, and the entire production team created something that has the qualities any Disney film, any good film, should strive to have. Wonderful characters, beautiful visuals, amazing music, and a timeless message. Honestly, when it comes to filmmaking, what more could you wish for?